Hello and welcome back to the smoke room. We will be continuing where we left off in Clifford's route. Um, if you last recall in that route, it was when um, Sam made the decision to basically amscray. Um, but he also ended up telling Clifford that um, he was the one that killed the miner in the mine. And he's more or less there in order to basically escape Echo. Uh, much to Clifford's surprise and sort of worry and um, sadness, I guess, a little. Um, but yeah. Also, as you've no doubt noticed, it has a new UI. Um, aside from this, like obviously the text and certain other things are different now. It has a little gradient right here and stuff. And when the characters are talking, it has a different text box. And it like has a color-coded thing. To tell you who is talking. It also has the open dyslexic font. But um. It kind of looks a little weird. For the game. And while it helps me read. It I guess. It looks better this way. And sometimes the open dyslexic font. Has a little bit of um. Issues with fitting text into boxes. It kind of makes certain things sort of. Roll off to the side. So anyways um. Well, without further ado, let's continue with Clifford's route. The sun's gone down completely, and I can't even begin to count the number of stars I see. It's a beautiful night out. At least, it is, for a brief moment. Someone's plucking at a guitar off in the distance. That coyote, no doubt. Has to be. It's sounding less like music and more like something being put out of its misery. Just hope our companions aren't awake to hear it. The fox tisks. And so the moment is spoiled. But quite the moment it was. No second or third thoughts this time, Mr. Tibbets. What about a fourth? Do shut up, Mr. Burns, or I might just change my mind. So cocky all of a sudden. What brought this on? Well, I... I've not had yet my turn on top, have I? I can't let you boys have all the fun. Smells like you had fun, all the same. Speaking of smells... He gestures to the glistening white stain still visible on his stomach. Looks like Cliff didn't get all of it. I'm not sure I can get this out of my fur with just hot water. Oh, right you are. I hadn't considered that. I have some perfume left, if you'd like to use it. Murdoch puts a hand on his side, one eyebrow cocked. After all this time... How much of that stuff did you bring? A considerable amount. Us stouts, we tend to get rather... Er, what's a polite way to put it? We're a little past prim and proper after what we just did. He laughs. All right, we tend to reek. Harsh, but true. Foxes aren't much better. Sam! He shakes his head. Slicking back the wet fur between his ears. Still, perfume? I'm quite aware most men prefer cologne. I just fancy floral scents, is all. The woman in my life seemed to like it. He turns his head to me as he washes himself, tail thumping against the shallow water. What about you, Sam? I'm coming around to it. Most men I'm with don't even bother with the cologne. They just smell like they crawled out of a hole. Well, it is a mining town. By all accounts, they probably did. Yeah, so I prefer a guy who bathes. See? I never said I didn't like it. It's just... Well, it's unique. Speaking of, did you say women? You don't have a missus waiting for you at home, do you? Cliff laughs. Not quite, although my father certainly tried to pair me off. Numerous times. Numerous times, he says. Popular feller, aren't you? I suppose he just wants me to carry on the family name. I've had my fair share of dalliances and courtships, but none of them bore fruit. Hard to imagine him as a father. Of course, I'm expected to return and marry someday. Loathed as I am to admit it, I have certain responsibilities and duties to my family I cannot shrink so easily. Murdoch's ears splay backwards, 
and for a moment, his expression cracks. There's no witty retort this time. Is that something you want, though? If you ask me, in my heart of hearts, no. It is not something I desire. I desire to be free, to continue exploring, not throw it away, to live in a dusty mansion because my father once did the same. What I desire at this moment is for this night to last forever. But we both know that's just a wish. Soon the sun will come up, and we will have to keep going. Much like I will have to return to my family someday. What happens if you don't? I would be disowned, first and foremost. I'd lose my funds, lose my home. It's unthinkable. What you're describing doesn't sound much like a home to me. True, but who am I if not a... a, a Tibbets? Be honest with me. Would either of you have joined me were it not for the money involved? Or my status? Murdoch's eyes fall on mine. So it has been for most of my life. I... quite frankly, I've never had friends. Real friends, I mean. Father had associates from all over the world, and they had children they'd bring along to our estate, but they'd always leave sooner or later. They weren't really there to be my friends. They were there just out of happenstance. Because my father was one of the richest men in the city. I think I understand what you mean, but your assumptions aren't correct. True, we joined the expedition because of the money involved, but that doesn't make tonight any less special. I wouldn't have joined you here or done what we just did if I didn't care. I'm sure Sam feels the same way. He's right. Don't give just about anyone a free ride. Thank you both so much. And who knows? I could see this partnership lasting quite a while. Now, let's get bathing before they send out a search party. We've been gone for a long time. I submerge myself in the spring until the water's at my shoulders, closing my eyes. Feels a lot nicer than taking a bath at home. I'm gonna miss this. By the time we're clothed and ready to head back, it's a good half an hour later. My fur is still a little damp and the perfume's way too much, but the thoughts that were eating me up just hours ago seem to have quieted down. I'm at ease, relaxed, more mindful of the smells and sights around me. I know it's temporary. The thoughts are going to come back sooner or later. They're never really gone, and at this point, I'm not sure if they will ever will, even if I leave everything behind. For now, though, I don't see the harm in letting myself just enjoy tonight. You think they're missing us? They haven't come to look for us yet. He smirks at me as he buttons up his vest. So what's keeping us from enjoying ourselves just a little longer? You know very well we can't dawdle. If we're to leave for the settlement at dawn, we'll need all the rest we can get. We had a rough couple of days. The settlement will still be there tomorrow, you know. I hear far off rustling in the bushes, underscored by a deep rumbling laugh. My claws come out, but I see nothing come out from beneath the trees. Another voice joins in, this one even deeper. Sounds like Avery. Cliff looks like he's about to pipe up again, but we gesture for him to keep quiet. Mmm, come on, Jeb. What if someone sees? Been waiting too long to see you again. It's only been a week or two. Seems like we're not the only ones active tonight. They're up to something, for sure. You don't think that they heard us, do you? They would have said something if they did. We wait around for a little bit to see if the voices get closer, but they don't. I just heard more rustling. Hello? Shit! Cliff shoots an annoyed glance at Murdoch. The fox seems to just shrug it off. We hear more rustling as Avery comes out from behind the tree. Jedediah right behind him. That's the second time that I'd mistaken his antlers for branches. Well, <laughs> Fancy running into you folks here. We were, uh, just heading out to the spring for a couple of minutes. I take it you boys are all finished up. You could say that. Water's nice and warm. 
I feel better already. Not so. Well then, I suppose we'll follow your example. He drags Jedediah down the path by his wrist. The horse looks a little startled. We'll see you at the camp. Don't wait up for us. You folks have fun now. It's cute. When we get to the camp, it's a fair bit less crowded than it was before we left. I think some folks already went to bed for the night. Though, they won't get much sleep with this coyote trying to put his guitar out of its misery. I don't know the first thing about musical instruments, but I know they ain't supposed to sound like that. It's even worse hearing it up close. And yet, I can't look away. Good God. It's not too late to head back to the spring. Disturb Jedediah and Avery, no doubt ruining their night, or listen to this for one moment longer. Difficult choices. Let's just sit down and have a drink. I'm quite parched. Strenuous activity will do that to you. Avery gave you that line. Murdoch shrugs, an all-too-cocky grin plastered on his face. I'm surprised he still has the energy for it. I'm starting to get more than a little tired myself. Well, hello there, Ed. There you fellas are. Reckon you drown in the spring with how long you've been gone. That sort of thing doesn't happen often, I hope. Only once or twice. That's once or twice too many. What have you been up to? Just been plucking away. I swear this old thing is starting to lose its sound. It might be a little out of tune. More than a little, I'd say. Could you hand it over? I'll see what I can do. You play? I sneak in some practice where I can. A man after my own heart, I do say. Think you could help a fella out? Sure, hand it over. Cliff and I watch as Murdoch takes the guitar and proceeds to busy himself with it for the next half hour. Before long, it's starting to sound less offensive to my ears, and by the time Avery and Jedediah return, it sounds almost like a real instrument. Murdoch really does have a lot of talents. That'll do the trick. You fixed her up right quick! Not a problem. Hopefully she'll treat you better from now on. And our eardrums, too. Want me to give it a try? I think he's just hesitant to give it back to him. You know any songs? Only a couple raunchy ones. You really are a keeper. We got a couple of other musicians with us today who might be willing to join. Wouldn't that disturb the people currently in their tents? The coyote waves them off. They've heard worse. Well, if you say so. Fancy a dance, Samuel? In front of these people? You'll be all right. I'll lead. That's not what I'm worried about. I know just the song. Oh, you guys are in for a treat. Wind rocks the desert night, the summer sand, natural things. Naturally, what frontiers men should understand And nothing's more natural than knowing how to move Here's a tune about an ache that we can soothe Let's reenact a snappy scene that duds might find mundane About a pair of partners who hit up and missed their train One grabbed the other's wrist and asked to buy a man some hooch of course the other said, we'll slay or another working pooch. He tossed and taps a shoulder blade as temperance flies the coop. Then eyes meet eyes and glass meets glass as whiskers start to droop. Well, if you're feeling spry and gay, I think you know what's next. Lock eye to eye and elbows hooked and keep your partner flexed. It's your way. 
whistle, quench your thirst, though it'd be hard to see. Having vice ain't always nice, but hey, at least you're free. Now take a dip and hook his hip, remind me of that scene. Where words pass lips between the sips and somewhere rather mean. But hey, they're breasting closer, hey, their courage bloomed, and hey, they're taking wagers, boasting over which their manhood loomed. Though side to thigh and pockets frisked, he grabbed his partner's wrist. Got a different kind of drink for you, I simply must insist. mind grows foggy as those spirits fade look now how morning light is seizing our charade ruffled slack sweaty backs all about the floor revel quietly as others about you snore lock gazes and think upon my scene you may find the things they hadn't yet in thoughts between lovers light morning dark and everything you know there's many locks and keys as you allow. Clifford, Chapter 3 Lovely work, Cornelius. You're really getting the hang of this, aren't you? I feel my body grow warm as the old stout sitting next to me leans in close to the canvas to inspect my work. I draw my eyes to the old wooden floorboards to avoid his gaze. He smells of paint and smoke, as does this whole eight lear, whereas others might find it an offensive odor, it puts me at ease. It reminds me that I am in the presence of an artist. A friend. A kindred spirit. I am nowhere near as close to matching you, Grandfather. Pish posh, your compositions and use of color are already outstanding, and you're, what, fifteen? Fourteen and a half, sir. I turn 15 this September. I don't blame him for losing track sometimes, not with all that's happened. Even so, his memory is getting worse. I'm quite certain he thinks Mary is still six at times. Fourteen and a half? My, how time flies. I remember when you couldn't even pronounce the word easel, and look at you now. You'll be making royal portraits by the time you're twenty, mark my words. My face grows warmer still. Not if father has anything to say about the matter. Did he get cross with you again? He doesn't like it when I spend time with you. He calls it a waste of a bright mind. And you? I disagree. Is that all? Usually you speak more freely. I'm well aware that man loathes me, lad. No need to hold back for my sake. It's just that... Art speaks to me in ways his business lectures don't. It takes me places I've only ever dreamt of, yet he intends to contain me in an office for the rest of my life, as though I'm some sort of beast to be caged and trained. It bores me to tears. Perhaps he's merely trying to keep you safe. He's only become worse since mother... I stop, and for the shortest of moments, so does my heart. It aches. It's the first time I've spoken about her in a year, and yet the wound still feels fresh. Since mother passed. His face falls at the mention of her. Her passing changed us all. I don't blame your father for wanting to keep you close, but you have a serious aptitude for the canvas, Cornelius. It would be a waste of a bright mind not to hone it further yet. Th th thank you, sir. 
I look past him at his canvas. Well, I've been busy painting portraits, it looks like he's been busying himself with a painting of a structure unlike anything I've seen. What did you end up painting? It looks rather elaborate for an afternoon sketch. Ah, it's nothing. He gives me that look, that grin. It means he has something to hide, and he desperately wants me to find out. And find out I shall. I'd very much like to know. Ah, very well. Are you familiar with the Masetta tribe? I can't say that I am, sir. I wasn't expecting you to be. There's an entire ocean between us, after all. So, how did you hear about them, sir? I recently happened upon a most curious book. I brought it for you. Of course, but I was rather fascinated myself. Why, I finished it in a single night. He points at his canvas. The paint is still wet. This is what they call a Hogan. It's a Masetta dwelling. It looks nothing like the houses lining the canals here. What's more, it seems to be located on a rocky, sandy landscape, even more unlike the Batavia that I know. Is this what they call a desert? It's got a rather unique shape. Why is that? The round shape is symbolic of the sun. He gestures to the doorway he's just painted on. The door faces east, so that when the people living in the Hogan wake up every morning, they'll see the sun rise. Exactly. I've always wondered what it was like outside of Batavia. I'd very much like to hear more. You'll see for yourself one day, Cornelius, when you're old enough. And with it, all the beauty the world has to offer. May I read the book? Piqued your interest, have I? It's difficult not to. Father only lets me read business ledgers. It's right there on my desk. Have at it. The paint has yet to dry anyway. Thank you very much, sir. Do please stop calling me, sir, young man. I'm your grandfather, not the king of Batavia. An unpleasant warmth is the first thing that I feel when I wake up. The second, a warm, sweet body draped over mine. My vision's blurred without my glasses, but the white fur is unmistakable. He's sleeping soundly, long tail flicking against my leg much like it did the first night that we spent together. Much as I'd like to let him stay, his weight and the heat radiating from him are coming close to suffocating me. After all the setbacks I have, we have suffered, I'd rather not my life ended by a lover rolling over on top of me. Samuel? Thirst stings the back of my throat as I speak. It would seem last night's merriment took quite a lot out of me. I give him a little tap on the head. It gets a little reaction from him. His tail flicks against my leg again. It tickles, and I can't keep myself from twitching. Is it Samuel? I struggle to get out from under him, but his weight has reduced me to writhing rather awkwardly. Quite unbecoming, but it does cause him to stir and finally open his eyes. Without my glasses, I can only see the color, that brilliant red, and immediately all is forgiven. He makes a sound, somewhere between a grunt and a purr, and yawns. Morning, Professor. Um, you are... He looks down, no doubt realizing he's crushing me. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh heavens no, it's quite alright. Putting on the airs has become as comfortable as slipping into a shirt. My voice manages to go up in a pitch when I'm around him. Did you sleep well? Yeah. Not one for morning conversation. I'm used to it by now. Father always told me that I could talk for two. He gets up on his knees, and I savor the breath I've been holding in these past long minutes. He seems to regard my predicament with a degree of amusement. And while I usually cannot tell whether his affection for me is genuine or just part of his profession, this smile in particular seems true enough to me. I don't quite know what time it is at the moment. 
It is still rather dark out. I haven't heard anyone call for me yet. For all I know, we still have hours before we need to leave. And it still wouldn't be enough. His fingers dance down my chest. My heart thumps underneath them, a bit more frantically than I would like. He looks anything but restless. It's the first time that I've seen him without a furrowed brow, without bags under his eyes. I sit up and he leans forward, meeting me halfway. The kiss we share is long and yet all too brief for my liking. I don't know what he's feeling right now, but it's the only way that I can convey what I truly feel, what even I lack the vernacular to express. How I wish it did not have to be this way. How I wish I could spirit him away in the dead of night to some far-off foreign country where no one knows our names. Where we can shed the hand of cards society has dealt us and start fresh. Where both of us can stop pretending to be people we are most certainly not. But once all of this is over, I might never meet this man again. When I pull away from him, the world feels a lot colder. I take solace in his paw cupping my cheek and clasp it tightly. Thank you. What you making a sad face for? Oh. I put on my brightest smile once more. Absolutely nothing to be worried about, just anxious to get to work. There's ever a time when you're not thinking about this work. He's as frank about the subject as ever. Well, there was last night. Hey, you folks alive in there? We scramble away from each other, struggling to put our clothes back on in such a cramped space. Quite amusing considering the ease with which we slipped out of them only a few hours ago. It would seem Samuel recovered his change of clothes from what was left of our supplies yesterday. Shame, I'm going to miss the overalls Avery put him in. He looked cute as a button in them. J just a minute! As I reach into my pack, it tips over and a large cylindrical object spills out onto the floor. I freeze. I can't make out what it is without my glasses, but I remember the smell of animal skin. It's the map Manaba and God showed us. I hear Sam curse behind me. Under his breath, he probably doesn't think that I can hear him as usual. What is this? I reach for my glasses as the world around me becomes crystal clear. So does the expression of worry on Sam's face. You can tell me. I... I was going to take it with me when I left the Hogan. I didn't put it back. You can't be serious. The look he gives me is all too serious, however. Hello? We'll be out shortly. Don't worry. We'll figure something out. Uh, are you gonna tell? For once... He's the one stuttering and mumbling. Tell whom? Avery? Doing so could very well jeopardize my already shaky standing with the Masetta and ruin my mission. It was in my pack after all, and the man already doesn't seem to have the highest opinion of me. But if I don't, I might end up in even more trouble. I shake my head. I'll have to think this through very carefully. Not so early in the morning though. I put the mat back in my pack, careful so as not to tear or damage it. Sam watches me. He's fidgeting. As much as this unforeseen situation worries me, I can't bear to see him like this. Breathe, Samuel. It's going to be alright. He does, and after getting dressed, I push up the flap of the old tent. Mr. Burns' bright red fur and brighter smile is the first thing that greets me. I force my brightest smile in turn. Good morning, Murdoch. You sure took a while. Almost had me worried you wouldn't come out at all. Oh, did we leave you all waiting? Just me. Avery and Jedediah are still sleeping too. You and Sam weren't the only ones going off together last night. I was feeling awfully lonely, you know. After we had such a lovely evening. This tent's already barely fitting both of us. 
You know as well as I do, I have no problem slipping into tight spaces, Sam. Isn't that right, Cliff? I feel my face grow warm despite myself. I... Uh, you did enjoy it, right? I'm only picking this because the, the Murdoch's music always makes me sad. Yes, very much so. He perks up. The spring should still be free if you want to go again. I click my tongue at him. You're incorrigible. You didn't seem to mind last night. It's true. I feel a shiver crawl up my back just recalling last night's events. The manner in which they both looked down at me. Their taste on my tongue. I stop myself before my thoughts get too explicit. I look behind me to gauge Sam's reaction. He gives me the smallest of nods. There's a smile on his face once more, as if it never left in the first place. We do still have some space in our tent, cramped as it is. Want to come in for a little while? I'd be right happy to. Oh, Murdoch. After we bid goodbye to everyone we met last night, we once again set off, hopefully for the last time. I'm, it's amusing in a way. I wonder what my superiors will say about what happened to me if I present it all with a naked honesty. I wonder what they'll think of Echo, that bustling jewel in the sand, and of its inhabitants. I doubt most of the things that transpired will even make it into my report once all of this is done. A monster coming for us in the night, a man murdered in a mine, a mysterious cabin out in the woods. Last but not least, a rat getting whisked away with no one knowing where he went. They'd probably reject it outright. And then there's Samuel and Murdoch. Well, that part of my story will certainly remain private for now. I'll have to settle for treasuring these last few days I can spend with them. Perhaps... By the time I'm old and decrepit, it might make for a nice chapter in my autobiography. As the sun slowly ascends the sky, I once again feel the scorching desert heat bearing down on me. We've scarcely left the camp and my shirt is already clinging to my fur. After I just bathed this morning, too. That's the one thing I'm not going to miss about this place. How much ground are we covering today? I'm quite jealous of the composure Sam carries in public in the wake of terror. Whether it's all a front or not, he makes it look easy. I wish that Clifford Tibbetts, that I, could be that confident. Cliff? Oh! I caught myself daydreaming again. I clear my throat, my muscles dry again. We should be there in a little while, I'd say. Not too long now. Y'all still got legs to stand on? Someone's perky today. Don't you worry, we've built up some muscle. We should be getting plenty of time to recuperate in the coming week. I mostly can't wait to put on my regular clothes again. A week? Studying takes time, Samuel. A week isn't even that long. There's studies which take months, if not years. So... It's a vacation of sorts. He shrugs nonchalantly. Not for you, it isn't. I'll still need someone to take pictures for my thesis, you know. Mm, too bad. I was looking forward to seeing what sites this town has to offer. Maybe do some nature photography? He's butchering it on purpose, isn't he? Still, it's good enough to get a chuckle out of me. It's not a happy place, I'll have you know. That comment seems aimed slowly at me. I have little choice but to take it in stride. Are there a lot of folks living in that settlement? It's not a tenth of the size of Echo, I'd reckon. Folks are only allowed to leave for trade. At all? Yeah. And only with permission from the military or an agent. 
Why? So that they can control us, keep an eye on us. He scoffs. Can't go where we please, can't do as we please. It pains me to hear that. I'm well aware of the way my contemporaries discuss the Maseta, as well as other tribes like them. But still, it's quite disheartening. I strive to improve relationships between us so that we can understand one another. The last thing I want is to dismiss our relationship further. Has anyone ever raised a fuss about it? Believe me, plenty people have. But we don't make the rules. Their military is all too happy to bend their own to take what they want from us. I'm sure with the correct reasoning. I trail off as their eyes bore into me. How do you go about changing a situation like this? The desert isn't a good place to ponder matters like these. Either way, I'm starting to get parched. By the time the sun's looming high in the sky, we reach a large town, gate not unlike Echo's. There are two canines posted at the entrance, but their garb doesn't resemble what I know of a Maseta clothing. And they look armed to the teeth. Jedediah walks on ahead to talk to them. One of them turns his head to give us a once-over. Even after focusing his attention on Jedediah once more, his eyes stay glued to Avery and our fisherman friends. It's a look of utmost disdain I've not seen the likes of since the gentleman at Segura's hip brought me outside. He finally tips his head back, shouting something I can't quite make out. Jedediah beckons us near, and the sturdy metal gates open with a shriek that might very well be loud enough to wake up the entire settlement. Or no one, it seems. And that's where I'm going to leave it for today. Um, I'm cutting it off right here because the tone of this part and the tone of the beginning part are very different. But, um, yeah. So, speaking of the first part, uh, the whole little music video that they added was very, very cool in my opinion. It's, it kind of seemed like a theme of songs in visual novels. Uh, but yeah, so... What did you guys think? Uh, did the little music video also surprise you? Did you guys enjoy it? Because I enjoyed it. And I don't care if you guys enjoyed it, because I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of nice to see that in every route, Sam progressively gets a bit more um, comfortable with the characters. And he starts to drop his guard down a little bit more, little by little. Um, it hasn't exactly happened with in the Nick story yet. He's still very much um, guarded, but he's more open to interacting with other people. Like, he's more um, friendly with Yao, and he seems a bit more cooperative, even though there's crazy stuff happening in the mines. But yeah. And in this one, he's opened up more to the idea of Cliff and, you know, being with him and being more, I know, expressive and open in front of other people. And he even danced in front of other people. And I guess this depends on your choices, but also being open with Murdoch. Although he hasn't gotten to know him that much more because we know specifically that Murdoch has issues with his family. So when, um, uh, I actually, I don't know if it's this part or the, no, I think it's this part. Yeah. Um, when Murdoch gets a little apprehensive when he asks Cliff if he enjoyed what they did the previous night, um, you can answer like, oh, no, 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 you know, that was a fun distraction. Murdoch, like, visibly, like, ugh. But then, like, he, he goes back to his, like, usual default, like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. But, um, he seems to be happy if you tell him, like, oh, yes, it, it was, you know, nice. You know, it was nice being with the two of you. Like, he, he relishes that intimacy that he gets with Cliff and also Sam. And in his own route, he basically falls in love with Sam. And he even tells Sam that he, that he knows it's weird and probably wrong that he wants to wake up with Sam. You know, basically being, 
you know, going to sleep with him, and basically living a life with Sam. Even though there are other things expected of him, and even though his family probably wouldn't care if he disappears, because they, they you know, kind of... Damn you, it's probably Omar. <laughs> Damn you, Omar. Um, but yeah, back to Cliff. Uh, but also Cliff has these family things that are expected of him. He has to go back to Batavia and fulfill his father's expectations. But, and I don't know if this is actually canon, but technically Clifford Tibbetts or Cornelius Van Hallowick is actually related to somebody in the town of Echo in the, I guess it would be future for the smoke room. Um, and I, I think I've already said it, but if you don't know who, then just think, who's the only other mustelid that isn't an otter in this town in the future? Hmm? Who qualifies for the whole weasel type species? Now, anyways, then. Also, no, 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 this is a spoiler for the next episode, so no, I can't mention that. But, um, I guess I can mention. So we are arriving at an, what is essentially an Indian reservation, which, if you don't know, somehow, is what is a place where people were taken to, well, not people, Native Americans. They were, you know, essentially forced out of their land because settlers were coming and saying, oh, this is a nice place to live. Oh, but there's people already here. Ew. So they would essentially force them to leave by force you know and sometimes it would be lethal force so they were taken to like just strange new places or um places that were basically unfavorable to the white settlers and i'm saying white because honestly it, it was white people even when the spanish came spanish were white <laughs> and um yeah so i'm from california that's why i mentioned spanish um, so yeah. Uh, so don't expect it to be very nice. Well, it's kind of funny too, because Clifford has that sort of like mental image or um, that fantasy that like, oh, I'm going to arrive at the Meseta settlement and it's going to be all like, you know, all wonderful. We're going to see pottery. We're going to see a whole bunch of colors and stuff. But that's not how it is. That's That wasn't how it was for them. Uh, even now, in some places, it's not that good. But anyways, um, enough about that. So uh, write down in the comments what you think is going to happen in the settlement. And what you thought of the song number. <laughs> I, I'm kind of glad that they didn't make me sing it, because... Although it would have been cool, I, I I think it would have sucked. So it's it's cool that they got um uh Moe or an Anthemix 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 who did the music. I think George Squared wrote the lyrics and I, I don't remember who sang it, but it's in the credits. So and it's in the the build log. So you can go look over there to find out who did it. But yeah. So um uh, without uh so yeah, anyways, um uh, thank you for watching slash listening. If you would like to play the smoke room yourself and find out what happens, um, you can find it over on itch. If you would like to support um, the Echo Project and get early access to all of their visual novels, um, you can you know subscribe to their Patreon. And if you would like to follow them on Twitter for um, like little alerts or whatever when the new builds of their stories go up, then you know follow them on Twitter and all of those links will be present down in the description. And I guess that's it for now and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye.